Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Hard Histories conversation. My name is Kendra Grissom. I am the K-12 education intern supporting 1619 program at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And I am thrilled to be here today with the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project for this exciting conversation. Launched in fall 2020, the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project examines the role that racism and discrimination have played at Johns Hopkins. Blending research, teaching, public engagement, and the creative arts, Hard Histories aims to engage our broadest communities at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore in a frank and informed exploration of the myths that have become part of the university's story and to offer evidence of how race and racism have shaped Johns Hopkins. In spring 2023, the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project is hosting a series of conversations exploring the histories of Blackness, slavery, and racism in the Maryland area and beyond. Today, we are excited to host a discussion about the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore's efforts into researching the institution's own hard histories. I invite our panelists now to turn their cameras on. We are honored to have with us today, Teresa Soto in discussion with Hard Histories Program Director, Dr. Martha S. Jones. Together, Jones and Zota will discuss their experiences, insights, and challenges undertaking the vital work of hard histories in Baltimore and where that work pretends to go in the future. Teresa Soto has worked at the crossroads of education, equity, and the arts for over 25 years. She is currently the Ruth R. Martyr Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Walters Art Museum. She previously worked at the Hammer Museum at UCLA, Getty Museum, University of Arizona Poetry Center, and John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Central to Soto's career has been a commitment to creating inclusive spaces for diverse communities, both internally and externally. She frequently presents and publishes on topics related to inclusive teaching, implicit bias, and equity initiatives, and she is the co-editor of the book, From Small Wins to Sweeping Change working together to foster equity, inclusion, and anti-racism in, in museums, published in 2022 by the American Alliance of Museums and Roman and Littlefield. Dr. Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Prof Presidential Professor, I'm sorry, a professor of history and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the history of American democracy. Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, selected as one of Time's 100 must-read books for 2020. Dr. Jones and Teresa Soto will be in conversation for about 25 minutes, and then we'll turn to your questions. Please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A function. Finally, live captioning is available to our audience members within Zoom. We're also posting a link in the chat to the live transcript URL for those who prefer to access captions that way. Thank you, Dr. Jones and Teresa Soto for both being here. I will turn the conversation over to Dr. Jones and see you all at the end of the discussion. Well, good afternoon and thank you so much, Kendra, for um, being back with us at Hard Histories um, where uh, watching the amazing work you're doing at the Pulitzer Center and really uh, honored that you um, took time out from that to um, be back with us here. So thank you. And I know we'll hear a little bit back from you at the end of the hour. Um, but I want to um, just add to the welcomes uh, to you, Teresa, and say thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we saw each other, I think it was just a little more than a week ago, really, um, at the Walters. Um, I was there um, because one of our uh, graduate students um, uh, was performing in conjunction with one of your exhibitions. Um, and it was uh, an incredibly remarkable um, afternoon um, to see this dialogue between um, Peabody Conservatory, uh, musicians, um, composers, uh, performers, and um, the work both 
um, ancient and contemporary in the galleries at the Walters. So I, I didn't get to talk to you very much that day because you were incredibly busy. But um, I thought maybe I, I could just start by asking you to tell us a little bit about that program and how it came about and, and really how I think it's a great window into the way in which you are steering the mission uh, of the Walters. And, and thanks again for being here. Thank you so much, Martha, and thanks to Kendra as well for that wonderful and warm introduction. Um, yeah, it was so great to see you there, Martha. It was a really beautiful event. Um, it was an opportunity for us to invite students from Peabody's Black Student Union in celebration of Black History Month uh, to, in order to select, um, uh, provide opportunities for the students to select pieces in conversation with works of art in the galleries. And for those of you who may not know, Peabody is located just around the corner, really across the street from the Walters Art Museum. And we have been partnering with them for over two decades. So it really has been a longstanding partnership where museums, um, where the museum is open to performances by students at Peabody. But what was new about the program last Saturday on February 25th was that the students were performing in dialogue with contemporary art that was on view, which was in turn in dialogue with art from the Renaissance and Baroque periods. It was in conjunction with our Activating the Renaissance exhibition, which was an exhibition curated by my colleague, Joni Spicer, in which six artists, contemporary artists, the majority of whom were in Baltimore, were in dialogue with, con with the Baroque and Renaissance works. So not only were the contemporary artists activating the Renaissance, but the students from Peabody were also activating the Renaissance through their music as well. And I wanted to share one of my favorite moments from that performance because I think it will just tell a story of the power of that program. It was when the guitarist, um, whose name is Bobby Bush, he began playing a piece that he composed, an original composition that was inspired by his mother. And he was performing in front of a painting, of a work, a photographic work with uh, mixed media by an artist named Tani Chapman, a local artist. And Tani Chapman's work is um, often celebrates black children and familial bonds. And so we have this guitarist that's playing a song inspired his, by his mother in front of a work that depicts a mother and child, which was in turn in dialogue with a 16th century painting that we believe uh, is the first portrait of a child of African ancestry in European art. So it was this really beautiful celebration of black children across time periods and geographies. Um, and certainly our mission at the Walters, which is to bring art and people together for enjoyment, discovery, and learning is exemplified in that program. But I would say that even beyond that, one of our strategic initiatives at the Walters is to expand the stories and histories that we share. So we don't just wanna show art made long ago in another country, we are interested in making connections to our community today. So I mean, one of the things that was striking, if I'm if I understood correctly, is that you all actually have commissioned these contemporary works. And, and I wonder how that changes the work in the museum to be working with with living artists, with Baltimore based artists, um, with artists who are bringing um, a very different set of um, concerns and imperatives and perspectives than um, what, I, what I, for a long time, I think expected at the Walters, which is that I would be visiting with um, Baroque and Renaissance materials that um, had old and important histories, but didn't speak so directly to our own time. Yeah, so that that exhibition, Activ Activating the Renaissance, um, is we'll start to see more of contemporary works in the gallery. So the opportunity to connect with contemporary artists um, is something that the museum has long been interested in and something that we're continuing to do more of. The artists that we selected, um, the works were not necessarily commissions, mm -hmm. but they were certainly um, works that 
offered a good pairing. So you could see, um, for example, the, in the example that I gave, a mother and child depicted from a contemporary viewpoint juxtaposed with a 16th century painting that also showed a mother and child. And it showed the connection across time and across um, geographic regions. So we are, are really interested in doing a lot more of that. Um, I, and it, but it's very true that the, the Walters Art Museum's founding collection, which was um, from Henry and William Walters, was originally 22,000 works of art that represent the tastes of the collectors. And those tastes, much of which um, is true for collectors at the 19th, um, early 20th century, are grounded in Eurocentric worldviews. Um, although William and Henry Walters did collect some Asian art, um, some Egyptian art, some Islamic uh, uh, art from the Islamic world, they really predominantly had European and some, some American art. So it takes a very, very long time for an institution to expand beyond those original founding collections to be more diverse and to be more in um, alignment with the community that we are situated in. So although it is a, an effort of the institution to um, make sure that our stories are connecting across time and cultures, we certainly want to make sure that um, when people come to the museum, they're not just seeing people um, that are that are mostly white, predominantly white, but that are also seeing people that look like them. And so we are making a lot of strides in that area. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I'm sure about is that it doesn't just take time; it takes people. Um, and you've come to the museum. Uh, only recently, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but um, I really am interested in um, inside the museum, sort of what is the team like, um, what does the team um, need to do in order to, um, if you will, move a museum through time um, to help it see itself in new ways. Um, so you've mentioned um, curators, um, but I hope can you help us see a little bit more what's happening behind the scenes, I guess? Thank you for that question, Martha, because it really does take a village to do the work of a museum. We're a highly collaborative museum at the Walters. Um, and in order to just pull off a program like the Peabody Museum, not only are we in conversation with the curator of the exhibition, but also conservators who need to ensure that the decibels of musicians are at a certain level that wouldn't impact the artwork. Of course, we're talking to our colleagues in building operations, visitor experience in order to do that. And that's just one program. Um, so every single program that we do at the museum is going to involve multiple people and every single exhibition and installation also involves a number of different departments. Um, one of the things that really drew me to the Walters was the incredibly collaborative process for exhibition development that we have. Um, typically and historically and in most institutions, exhibitions are held within the curatorial department. Mm -hmm. At the Walters, although that is true, many people are, are around the table, including learning and community engagement, visitor experience, um, many departments that are sharing their perspectives as well. And so this, um, this team right now, we have, I would say about 130 or so staff members at the Walters. And um, it is a changing team. My team in particular, the Learning and Community Engagement Department is a, is a new one. So when I started in October of 2021, I was tasked with building the new Learning and Community Engagement Department. Prior to that, it was the education department. And we changed the name in order to be in alignment with and show the, the importance of community engagement at the heart of our work. It is no longer um, about education, solely educating the public, if you will, about the works that are in the museum, but also how can we better be a better community part partners? How can we better engage the community in our work and so that there are reciprocal relationships? So when I started, there was um, for a while, just me and another colleague in learning and community engagement. Uh, now we have a team of 10. And by May, we will have a team of about 13, and it is one of the most diverse teams at the Walters. 
That's a tremendous commitment. Um, and I'll share just a, a personally, because um, you know I, I live not I live in the neighborhood of the Walters, and um, for us, the Walters was one of the first institutions to open its doors again um, after we had all been shut in for such a long time, and how meaningful it was to be on my you know out from my errands and to see the doors open again and be able to come inside and um, and to sort of re-enter into community in that way. I think it was very powerful for a lot of us in Mount Vernon and throughout the city. So um, we're so grateful to you all for being there behind the scenes, um, but you know, in a very tough time for so many of us um, doing the work then that it took to, to be back open again and to, to share the museum with us. You know, the first time we met, um, it was not so long, I think, after you had uh, come to the Walters and uh, we had a, a moment for a, a collaboration uh, between the Walters and Heart Histories at Hopkins, along with um, colleagues from the University of Virginia. Um, I think I had had some inkling about some of the questions that we shared. Um, we had been rethinking um, our founder at Johns Hopkins, um, you all were, it turned out, rethinking um, the Walters family um, and uh, who they were and, and their legacies. Um, and so part of what is um, so important for us in the work you're doing is um, this shared mission of self-reexamination and excavation um, but I know that's not easy um, and that that's not straightforward. Um, it certainly hasn't been that way for us. We've had to ask ourselves a lot of questions internally. We have met with um, critics and 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 folks who really would prefer we not ask those hard questions. So uh, can you tell us a, a little more about these questions that the Walters legacy has, um, presented for you all and, and how you're how you're working on that. Yeah, one of my first projects at the Walters was actually to work to display a broader history of the Walters in a very public visible space at the museum. And honestly, one of the reasons that I was so interested in working at the Walters is because of its commitment to be transparent about the complexity of its histories. And when you walk into the museum, um, you'll see, of course, our, our wonderful visitor experience team. You'll be welcome to the museum. Um, you have a sense of the world-class art in its space. And you also have panels that are, that are text panels that'll describe the founders, William and Henry Walters, and not just the positive things. Um, yes, they were art collectors without whom the Walters Art Museum would not exist, but they were also problematic individuals. They were Confederate sympathizers. Their wealth came from businesses such as uh, selling liquor and the railroad industry that depended on and profited from Southern economies that were based in slavery. Um, and I, as I mentioned, the original collection of William and Henry, of course, is grounded in a Eurocentric worldview. Um, so to be a museum in 2023 that, it, it, that is welcoming and accessible to our communities, we have to go beyond those histories and we have to be communicative about what those histories are. Yes, we can have um, an art collection that will bring in a lot of people that will admire its beauty, but we also acknowledge that there are some ugly histories behind all of that beauty. And so we're continuing to do research on William and Henry Walters. So that, that was just, you know, the text panels that I mentioned there um, give you a little bit of an understanding of that complexity, but we are going to be doing a lot more of that research. Specifically, we have a curatorial fellow at the Walters right now, Kristen Nassif, who is actively researching the ways in which William and Henry Walters' support of the Confederacy undergirded their, their fortune and their art collection. Um, so we have that research going 
now. And meanwhile, we have programs like the program that you mentioned, Depths of History, where we're really interested in investigating and interrogating the problematic histories of museums and institutions, inclusive of the Walters. In fact, our next one, I'll just put a little plug in here, our next program within that Depths of History series is on March 9th this week, and it will focus on the complicated subject of provenance, specifically as it relates to our Asian art collections. So, you know, these are opportunities for us to both acknowledge it um, and learn from our histories and make changes. And those are, those are things that we're, we've been doing both in the adult program sphere but also for younger audiences. We are also piloting a program right now called Living History, which will be for third through high school students. We think those are the age ranges we'll see during the pilot phase. And that will be an opportunity for young people to understand that history is not static and that history changes with the retelling of narratives and with new research and understandings. So, uh, more on that to come, but it really is something that the Walters is, is committed to. You know, something that, you know, we hear from time to time, you know, is I'll characterize as um, concern or even fear that um, in doing this work, you are, you're undermining or somehow compromising the institution. How, how do you talk with people about that? Because, um, I think on the one hand, we can understand those fears while also we want to show people another way forward. And, and yeah. I imagine like us, you know, you have, you're an institution that relies upon, you know, importantly, um, trustees and directors and um, philanthropic support and more. It's a lot of, it's a lot of um, stakeholders in a museum. And I wonder how you talk to folks like that about doing um, this kind of um, self-examination? Yeah, that's a great question, Martha. Um, one of the things that I think about in, in this work is that everybody can get behind the concept that we should tell more diverse stories. We should tell more nuanced stories. We should expand the histories that we share. Um, and so in, in just, Moving in that direction as a concept, um, we have to be inclusive of our own stories, of our own histories, or else it will feel disingenuous or would feel hypocritical. And so I think there's a broad understanding that that is, um, that is the work that we have to do that we're committed to. As a art museum whose work is grounded in scholarship around history and learning new histories and discovering new research, um, we cannot exclude our own histories in that scholarship. Um, so that is something that I have been very um, encouraged in my time at the Walters thus far to know that there's a lot of broad support for that work. Um, is it sometimes uncomfortable? Absolutely. Um, but we all know that when we're talking about individuals from a certain time period, we're not only talking about that person as an individual, but how they are situated in the framework of their historical and social and cultural contexts. And, you know, William and Henry Walters, not alone in, in, terms, of, in terms of white collectors that are um, looking at the art canon through a Eurocentric worldview. It is it's certainly not um, unique to that world. So I think there, that is also something we always need to to communicate is it's not just about an individual, but it's about systems that shape individuals and their tastes. Yeah, that's great. And I, and I wanna come back before we end and ask you a little bit more about the, the particular role and place of museums um, in the life of the city and, and encouraging a more full understanding of the history of the city itself. But I first wanna ask you about, um, uh, Hackerman House. It's Hackerman House. Am I right? Yeah. So, you know, one of my very first impressions of the Walters um, was coming to Mount Vernon um, during the renovation of, uh, I think, what is sometimes referred to as the Hackerman House, sometimes one West Mount Vernon place. Um, but your, your building right there on the corner um, facing the monument 
Um, and uh, one of my first kind of forays into Baltimore uh, was a year I spent um, very gratefully um, connected to a class at the Baltimore School from the Arts, which is right right around the corner from you all on um, on Cathedral. Um, and the students there uh, were, um, while I was visiting, um, composing a, a production uh, around the early history of politics in Black Baltimore. So, um, but the story I heard from them was about an earlier iteration of their class um, that had done some research into slaveholding um, in the Mount Vernon neighborhood more broadly. Um, and a kind of, I don't know, I'm gonna call it a guerrilla, um, a guerrilla art project in which the students then went out and um, hung little placards on buildings and, and so that we could all see for a moment um, that history surfaced. And so slaveholding households were marked as slaveholding houses. And one of them, as I understand, was Hackerman House. Um, so um, today you have this extraordinary um, installation connected to um, a woman named Sibby Grant um, who um, lived there. Um, and I wonder how you think about um, I think for many visitors who have come to that particular part of the museum to see um, an extraordinary collection of um, ceramic works, particularly ceramics from Asia, um, also encounter this experience um, and this history of slaveholding um, in the place. And um, how do you, uh, how do you, persuade people, encourage people, I don't know, insist that people deal both with the art they came to see, but also the, the, the facets of the place that perhaps they didn't expect to encounter at all. It seems to me must be challenging or jarring for some people. Hmm. You know, yes, I'm sure that that is the case, um, that it is that it can be jarring for some people and and I I, I say kind of I don't know if I say bring it on in the sense that um, when you go to an art museum there is an opportunity to engage with works of beauty um, there's an opportunity opportunity to think um, for, about topics that are you're going to walk away questioning wondering wanting to learn more um, and you situate that most typically within the artwork that's on the walls, right? That's what people sort of come to expect for an art museum. Um, at the Walters, we're just broadening that a little bit more. Um, not only are you thinking about the art that's on the walls, but you're thinking as well about the building as a kind of art form. And so we um, have the opportunity to work within historic buildings and therefore we are, uh, tasked with tackling its histories, however fraught they may be. And so um, in the case of Sibby Grant, who was an enslaved cook at Hackerman House, one Mount Vernon West, um, we, yeah, we, we learned of, of her um, through the work of, of students, which is incredible, right? Um, and so there, there is a perfect example of how when we engage with our community members, and we work together to uh, discover truths, both in the past and in the present, then we will be able to provide an opportunity for learning that is very multifaceted and nuanced. And so when you come to the Hackerman House, um, you can see a letter from Sibby Grant that was written to her enslaver, John Thomas. And in that letter, um, it, it, it's a really, it's a tricky one because we know that John Thomas was arrested for being a Confederate sympathizer and Sibby writes to her enslaver to basically say that she misses him. Um, and it, that feels a bit jarring and shocking um, as well as the fact that you are in a museum looking at beautiful works of ceramic arts and you understand this deeper history of our past. Um, I, I do believe that all of those things can happen simultaneously in an art museum. I think um, it's a matter of, of both understanding that when we see um, 
works, we're gonna walk away with a broader understanding of its art historical context, absolutely. But we're also gonna walk away with a broader understanding of the problematic aspects of its histories. Um, if we didn't do that, then that would be a disservice to telling history. Yeah, I um, I should say that um, the the students with whom I worked at the uh, Baltimore School for the Arts um, did their final production in Hackerman House, yeah. right in West One West Mount Vernon Place. So they brought that. It felt like a full circle, right? And and, and there they were now um, inhabiting the place um, and inhabiting it in the place with their own interpretations of the early history of Black Baltimore that included figures like Sibby Grant, yes, of course, but also included um, the poet Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and the political leader, George Hackett. Um, and I had to believe sitting in on those productions there um, that we really were seeing um, young people pulling a really powerful thread um, through place and invited to, in a sense, you know, very strongly by the presence of the building, um, and then being um, and then being invited inside to continue to interpret it. Um, and for me, that's really very strong. And thinking about site-specific work um, as, in a sense, embodied in our own buildings. One of the things you 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 gently promised me, you know, was that, you know, we we would talk more in the future about the the architecture of the Walters itself and um the way in which it tells stories about the chapters of Baltimore City. And I, I think um for us here on the Homewood campus, that has become a very important part of what we are doing is thinking through um, the physical space, thinking through the site, um, really recovering the layers um, of what is and what was, um, and trying to chart that really carefully um, when, in, you know, in a place, whether you're in Mount Vernon or you're up here at Homewood, where you know, the terrain is still shifting and developing and, and changing. Um, so I, I, I think there's something really exciting about the, the invitation, uh, particularly of Hackerman House, um, for um, many of us um, in the city. Yeah, um, so, I just want to add, yeah. sorry, just one, one thing is that um, that work continues. Actually, the Lyric had a performance that was focused on Sibby Grant um, back in the fall. And so we've been partnering with the Lyric and with uh, another one of our neighbors, the Baltimore Leadership School for Women, with high school students that went to the performance and are going to be coming to the Hackerman House and then we'll be writing some monologues inspired by what they see. So, you know, I would say it's a, a spiral um, rather than a full circle because the work is ongoing. Yeah, well, I, I love that. And, and you know that, um, you know, part of what um, led us to be so excited about having you here today is that you know, we have also had a, a version of that experience at Hard Histories where um, we find, you know, folks who are, you know, tuned in today. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, and I'm going to get to your questions in just a couple of minutes. So by all means, please drop them in the Q&A. But folks who are tuning in and who are following us, um, becoming partners, collaborators, allies. And um, so uh, there's something for me at least, I don't know how it feels to you, um, there's something brewing in Baltimore that's very, very powerful, um, which is this shared, shared questions, but more than simply questions, right? This share con shared confrontation, the shared reckoning with a past, you know, a, a, a high point in the in one sense in the history of this city, the third largest city in the United States, you know, burgeoning and commerce and railroads and law and more. Um, but now adding to that these these tougher histories. And we just see it, um, you know, everywhere we turn, we're meeting colleagues and collaborators who are doing that work. So I will 
pitch our own um, or preview our own um, uh, not so upcoming, but September 7th and 8th, um, we will be hosting a convening um, of, of so many of us who have been doing this work in our own institutions so we can see one another and talk about what it means for Baltimore um, that we have been doing this work, um, as you've said, for, for now, um, years now. So um, we're, we're, we're really excited about that. Um, so I warned you, I don't really have a fully fledged question here, but I did want to ask you about the big pictures of museums, um, because um, we've had the opportunity um, in one of our graduate seminars um, this semester, the Black World Seminar, for example, um, to begin the seminar at the BMA and in their um, recent exhibition, again, contemporary artists work on historical subjects in that case of the, um, the great migrations of the 20th century for black Americans. Um, but I wonder um, how you see um, the role of museums in the city. And in particular, do you see what I see, which is a kind of cultural um, leadership um, that is guiding us through um, some really important, um, yes, um, the beauty of the past and and all of the things that we come to expect to see in me, in in museums, but at the same time, um, letting us think through some uh, important and challenging questions and where you think you know not only you but you kind of in a landscape of remarkable museums in this city um, are in um, guiding us in in that work. Yeah, so this is an interesting question because um, I, I do feel that in this city, but I think that it also is a national reckoning of sorts, and, and at least in the museum field. Um, this con These conversations that, that we're hearing more frequently now, I think um, in the museum field, it started around 2014 when uh, there was a movement called Museums Respond to Ferguson, and it was, really was a opportunity for museum leaders to, to really urge museums across the country to be more responsive to what's happening in our communities, to take a stand about police br brutality. Um, and since then, we've had other movements. We've had the Museums Are Not Neutral movement. So uh, also on this idea that um, museums, well, they are not neutral. And so when we, um, both state that in a very direct way and also um, showcase the ways in which we are not neutral, then we are um, able to be more truthful with our communities and to be able to you know, do a lot of the work that we've been talking about in our, in our program today. Um, so that had, th those conversations have been happening for a while, but it really wasn't until I would say the pandemic and then all the protests that were happening in 2020, um, where it became a groundswell across the country. And that really a lot of museum professionals within their museums were calling for change and calling for museums to be um, more in dialogue with what's happening. And, and so, yes, I see that in Baltimore, but I do see that on a national level. And, um, and it's 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 a trend that I think is certainly not not going away. It really is um, a moment where many museums are having a kind of existential crisis, if you will. Um, mm. Museum professionals that that go through their training often were were grounded in um, a you know a certain art historical canon. Um, a focus on scholarship and research from an academic or, or scholarly perspective. Um, but now museums are, are being asked to reckon with the fact that those goals and pursuits are not necessarily the goals that their communities are asking of them. Um, and so how can we be a good resource, not just about coming to the museum and seeing the art, but how can we be a place of um, a space, a physical space for our communities? How can we be a, a, a better um, employer so that we have uh, opportunities to train our com uh, community members on job skills, whether or not they work at museums or elsewhere? Um, those are just a couple of, of things, but we're, we're really 
as a field grappling with the shift. Yeah, it's really interesting that you reframed it that way because our work too has a national dimension. Um, we are part of a consortium called Universities Studying Slavery, which, as you know, our, our friend Kurt Von Dack was so important in creating at the University of Virginia. Um, and the last count I heard, we are somewhere near almost 100 universities and colleges across the country that are um, doing this same work. Our origin story, it, it, though, is a, it just a little different. It, it goes back to um, Brown University and um, Dr. Ruth Simmons, um, who um, is the first Black American woman um, to lead an Ivy League institution. And she goes to Brown and she begins to hear the talk, see a bit of the evidence that is highly suggestive of Brown's historic ties to the slave trade, and then makes a different kind of decision about that information, that knowledge, um, rather than figuring out how to set it to the side or cover it up or to mute it in some ways. Um, Dr. Simmons steps in and says, we are, um, we are, we have the capacity as an institution to take on even the parts of our past that are, um, that are, that are terrible. And, um, and we can, we can use the, the skills we have, the resources we have, um, the way in which we produce knowledge, right, to, um, discover that and to illuminate that and to explain that and to incorporate that ultimately into our story. So we're working very much, I think, in these these long these on these long threads um, that um, can feel very particular in your in your own institution. Um, but for me, it's been really important to help folks see the bigger where we fit into a much bigger picture. So I, I appreciate that perspective. Um, so very much. Um, I think I'm going to um, try and pivot us to questions, if if I can, um, Teresa. I uh, um, uh, and uh, thanks to everybody who um, is uh, dropping their questions in the Q and A. Um, let me start from Jenny Wall, who asks. Um, it would appear that art museums are now at the forefront of redefining terms such as fine art and scholarly. Um, and so um, she asks, um, how can institutions like the Walters and Hopkins contribute to a more inclusive understanding um, and uh, a more inclusive valuation of knowledge itself? Hmm. That's a great question. I think it might be, dare I say, generous to say that art museums are at the forefront of that work, um, I think we're certainly doing a lot to make sure that we are up to date with um, with how we're using language in our spaces and making sure that um, that when we're engaging with the public that we are being as inclusive as, as possible. I would say that um, one thing about art museums, say, as opposed to this to academic circles is that because we are constantly in conversation with our communities, whether or not visitors are leaving comments in our comment book or through programs, Q and A's that happen, we are um, hearing a lot of very current conversations um, around language. And so um, we do make sure that we are using language in our um, in the best way possible. And I'll just say one particular initiative that I'm particularly proud of at the Walters um, is, is about community voices. So typically you go to an art museum and the, the gallery labels are primarily written by curators. And we are gearing up for the opening of our Across Asia installation of works in our Asian um, art collection as well as our uh, collection from the Islamic world. And in this installation, we will have community labels. We'll have labels that are written by community members in the language, in, the in terms of their topics, um, in terms of their perspectives from their lived experience, from their 
um, religion, from their cultural upbringing, so that when you come to the museum, you're not only seeing the art historical context of an object, but you're seeing about what matters to an individual in our community. And that is one way that, um, that I'm really proud of that the Walters is moving towards. And I think more museums are doing that as well. That's, um, that's wonderful. And I, I really look forward um, to seeing that. I, I, I'm somebody, well, you can imagine, I think the text really matters and, you know, and that, that piece of it. Um, so I really look forward to that. Um, so one of the things I love about our webinar is that, um, you know, folks are tuning in from all kinds of places, some of them um, super knowledgeable about the, uh, the, the conversations we're having. So I'm going to share this comment and question from Jan Davidson, which is about the research into the Walters family um, itself. Um, they write, I'm interested in seeing how you talk about Henry Walters connections to Wilmington, North Carolina. He met Sarah and Pembroke Jones in the late 1880s and spent a lot of time with them, then married Sarah after Pembroke died. That's the super knowledgeable um, kind of folks we have here. Thank you so much, Jan Davidson, for that. But the question is, um, so are you planning on looking into this part of the story? Is there a, a way in which we we need to recover a great deal about um, figures like the Walters? Um, you know, for example, we have no um, kind of scholarly biography of, of Johns Hopkins to, to turn to or rely on. Um, and so um, our work, but the work with our colleagues at Hopkins Retrospective, for example, you know, has been to have to, you know, build these families, this individual with these family stories from the ground up, because it really hasn't been done before. We really only knew snippets of it. So how deep do you go once you open, you know, the door to understanding the Walters family better? Yeah, thank you, Jan, for both the information and for the question. I think that um, it will remain to be seen how the research unfolds. So our, the curatorial fellow that I mentioned um, is really just embarking on that research and, and hopes to um, have an output of that research at the end of the fellowship, which will be fall or winter 2025. So we've got a long ways to go in terms of what we're going to unfold discover and how we will we'll be sharing it um, so more soon. I, I don't have a good answer to that, but I think um, we are very invested in, in finding out more. Well, I, and I'll say, um, you know, just to contribute to that, you know, for us, one of the tensions has been, uh, I think a productive one, but it definitely has been a tension, you know, as historians and historical researchers, you know, we're inclined to say, you know, ask us a good, meaty, challenging question and um, we'll come back to you in three years and five years and 10 years, having done the archival work, having tested our hypotheses, having integrated the scholarly literature. We don't, we don't work on a, on a short timetable. That's been one of our challenges here. And one of the reasons we do the webinar is to talk to folks in real time about the work we're doing as we're doing it. Um, so this, you know, um, the, the, you know, sometimes the urgency that folks feel about knowing the answers to these questions um, sits a little bit at odds with, I think, the deep research that it takes to really answer a question, you know, is, you know, how are connections to a family connections to a place um, like North Carolina and, and uh, you know, and a family um, like the Pembrokes, uh, you know, influencing, shaping, um, informing, um, what does that help us and, you know, know about the museum is a, a question I share. So I thank um, Jan Davidson for the question, but I appreciate um, uh, you all committing the resources, frankly, you know, to, to probing that question um, in a, in a, in a, sustained and, and rigorous way. It's, it's, it's really, I think, exciting um, for all of us. Um, so uh, here's a, a question um, that maybe is just, a, a for me, maybe a point of confusion. Um, Teresa Lyons asks, can you give a story of how the things that the Walt, the things the Walters did 
to promote slavery. And I, I'm not sure if the Walters references to the museum or to the family, um, but I wasn't sure I heard you connect the family or the history of the museum directly, its founding um, or its collection, though maybe you alluded to it when you talked about um, how their wealth had been um, had been generated. Is is there a more direct answer to the question about how slavery fits into, as you understand it today, the history? Yeah, of yeah. Um, the the Henry and William Walters they were Confederate sympathizers, so you know they used their power um, in order to support some of the efforts of. Um, of slavery. And I think the specifics to that is something that we are, we are very much researching, but we do know that they were actively um, supporting Confederacy. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, one of the things that um, we share in these stories is the connection to railroads. Um, Mr. Hopkins also, um, a great deal of his wealth and, and, and as well as his standing is derived from his role in railroads. And, um, and I agree with you, I think there's more to tell about the relationship between that sort of industry and um, slavery, which is, is not apparent, I think, always on the surface. So um, thank you for that. I think I have time for um, maybe one more question before Kenja's going to come back in. Um, and so um, this one is a question for me, but I'm going to, I'm going to, deflect at least for the moment. And I'm gonna invite folks to come back, um, you know, follow us. There are many opportunities to ask me questions about hard histories at Hopkins. Follow our, subscribe to our Substack where you can learn a great deal more about um, the specific work we're doing. But I think this is a question that is useful for both of us, um, which is about how we allocate resources between injustices of the past and injustices of the, the present. Um, and I don't know how that seems. Um, so the, so in this example from Steve uh, Jenks, um, you know, the past as in the, their example, slavery or the present health and employment. Um, is there room in the museum to be thinking also about the present, I mean, I think it's been running through our conversation, but maybe to ask you to speak to that more um, directly, how the, how, the, how the museum and its programming is thinking about inequities in our own, moment, in our own time. Yeah. Um, there are, I, I do see it as a continuum. So it's hard for me to um, separate the, the past and the present. Um, but I will say that one thing that uh, we are actively thinking about is, is really within the department that I have, Learning and Community engage, Engagement Department. Um, one of the main reasons, as I mentioned, in the shift from education to community engagement is to really put community engagement at the center of our work. And in that, we have defined community engagement as relationship building at its core. Um, and we are taking the time to listen to community members to come together and to achieve shared goals together. And in that, um, there are many opportunities to think about how the museum can be a, a good partner with our community in the present. Um, but that is, but a lot of those inequities are very much grounded in the past, right? Um, systemic racism, redlining, um, the inequities that we are seeing in Baltimore. Uh, yeah, again, it's hard to extricate the past and the present, but we are very much um, a museum for the public today. Yeah, and I, and I um, to be continued, because I think that um, there's another piece about, um, what I think of is, you know, the lane that that we occupy at Hard Histories, which is 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 um, allied with, adjacent to, complementary to, I think, other kinds of projects um, in the city, but not quite the same. So, continuing to think ourselves as ourselves as um, historians, and with a kind of humility about the kind of work we're not really. Um, 
expert to do. So no reflection on you all, but I, you know, just thinking about how we fit in a, 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 a sort of puzzle or a matrix of the city rather than all of the all of the questions and all of the solutions happening in, in quite the same um, crucible. So we, we wrestle with that a lot. Um, right. And I think to your question earlier around collaboration, I think that you, you really, we really can't do our work without being in collaboration with community partners in many different ways, whether or not it's through an individual community member who is providing a community label to our Across Asia installation or, or working in collaboration with an organization in order to work together to, to achieve um, something. So all of those things are are truly, truly important to the work of, of my team and certainly broadly for the Walters as well. Yeah. I'm gonna pass the mic back to Kendra, but um, I wanna thank you again for a, an extraordinary conversation and, and um, look forward to the next time I, I uh, bump into you um, at the museum or elsewhere. So um, thanks very much, Kendra, for taking us out. Well, thank you, Dr. Jones and Teresa Soto for this incredibly rich conversation. We are honored to have had you here and appreciate your, how your research sheds light on the questions being asked at the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project. Um, as a child, I frequented the Walters Art Museum. It was like one of my favorite places to go in the city. And so I personally appreciate the insight into the work happening there and learning a bit more about the Walters Art Museum as an institution and its history and the work you're doing to reckon with that history. Um, to our audience, thank you so much for watching and sending in your brilliant questions. And lastly, I would like to thank the team at the SNF Agora Institute for their support for this event. You can learn more about the Hard Histories at Hopkins project at hardhistory.jhu.edu. Additional information about the Hard Histories event series, as well as YouTube videos of past events is posted at snfagora.jhu.edu forward slash event. The Hard Histories at Hopkins project has exciting upcoming events on March 27th, April 5th, and April 17th. So please mark your calendars and look for registration links in the chat. Please also subscribe to the Hard History Substack at hardhistoriesjhu.substack.com where updates about project happenings are regularly posted. And again, thank you all for being here and have a fantastic rest of your day.